Hello, it's Jake here and welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is the first of a two-part discussion of Ayn Rand's great individualist novel, The Fountainhead. And the discussion is with special guest Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. In the first part of the discussion, in this episode, we mainly focus on taking a critical look at some of the ideas in the novel. Part two is more focused on the value of the novel for those of us seeking to live the voluntary life. Before we start the discussion, I'll just read out a brief overview of the novel from Amazon. The Fountainhead has become an enduring piece of literature, more popular now than when published in 1943. On the surface, it's the story of one man, Howard Rourke, and his struggles as an architect in the face of a successful rival, Peter Keating, and a newspaper columnist, Ellsworth Toohey. But the book addresses a number of universal themes, the strength of the individual, the tug between good and evil, the threat of collectivism. The confrontation of those themes, along with the amazing stroke of Rand's writing, combined to give this book its enduring influence. So that was just a brief overview for those who haven't read it yet. If you prefer not to know what happens in the novel, if you haven't read it yet, uh, you might want to read it first because we do discuss the, the plot but that will take you a while because it is a bit of a doorstopper, but it's well worth a read. Also, if you'd like to find out more about this podcast, you can go to thevoluntarylife.com. So thank you so much for listening and on with the discussion. Well, so, yes, The Fountainhead. Welcome, everyone. And, I mean, Steph, have you, like, has your thoughts about this book changed since you have read it with the perspectives that you have now on, on, um, on ethics and so forth? Because, I mean... The first thing that occurs to me is that um, there are a couple of pretty clear violations of the uh, non-aggression principle in that book by the you man who uh, embodies <laughs> true virtue, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, I think for me, the first thing to understand is that Ayn Rand was at war between philosophy and melodrama. And uh, I think you can see that quite a bit in her, in her writing as a whole. And uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that melodrama run it, won out in, um, uh, in, uh, it, it, to some degree in Atlas Shrugs, but, but definitely in The Fountainhead. Uh, I thought the first half of The Fountainhead was fantastic. I think that the second half, and I have this problem with a lot of uh, art, uh, particularly novels or movies, is that it just it gets so big that it's larger than the, than the ideas. It's like she couldn't handle just dealing with people's relationships. And so she had to have him, you know, blowing stuff up and going to court and, and all that kind of stuff. And I just thought that was, uh, um, that was too much of a reach for something big has to happen. And she herself had the same problem with the novel that she agonized, I think, for about two years over how to end it uh, before coming up with he'll blow up his, his architecture or something. And, you know, Dominique will be there to do all this, that and the other. So... Uh, so I think the melodrama went out over the philosophy, which I think is a problem. Right, right. But it's interesting that she did that she didn't work out how to to end it, or it took her a long time to work out how to end it. Because I mean, there are some great speeches in that book. I really enjoyed the. All, I mean, each of the main characters has like their big speech, and they're all really interesting. Even the uh, even the corrupt characters' main speeches are, are just fantastic. But, but as a, a kind of, you know, advert for what virtuous living does for you, um, you know, it all goes a bit horribly pear-shaped, really, doesn't it? Because, you know, he gets involved in raping Dominique and he ends up up a building and they spend most of their lives. She's involved in, you know, relationships that, um, well, that she doesn't want to be in until much later on. And so, you know, some, there's some interesting, there's an interesting distinction between what it means to to lead a virtuous life, according to, to, the, to, to the character of, of, um, of Rourke and, and the whole thing about, you know, not being second-hander and going your own way, and what that actually looks like on the ground in terms of the way that their lives go, you know? Right, and that is also begs, well, I think, one of the fundamental flaws with, and I've got so much to praise about with the book, but one of the fundamental flaws that I had was, is Howard Rourke, really very virtuous. I mean, does, does he struggle with virtue that much? Uh, the answer seems to be no, which again is kind of heroic and melodramatic, but I don't think it particularly helps people. I mean, to me, the, a lot of Ryan's, Rand's fictions is diets for thin people. Um, 
you know, people who are, who are already innately virtuous, uh, here's how to, you know, here's how they work. And there's not, there, there are some transitional characters, but uh, I, I'm, I think the argument could be made that, that Howard Rock is so innately strong that he's not actually very virtuous. Right. He doesn't actually learn to uh, implement virtue in his own life. He's just born Superman, essentially, isn't he? He's just like he, he comes into the world, it seems, pretty, pretty um, much preformed in that, in that way. And you said this about her books before, that what's missing is any sense of how the characters actually get to, to their level of virtue. They just, they just are you know, um, apart from the crowd from, from day one. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's right. And uh, he also, she, she hasn't solved the problem of how a virtuous man is pretty much a rapist, uh, or if it's, you know, consensual rape, if that makes any sense. And also, how, uh, why is a virtuous man, since sexuality and romantic attraction is so foundational to her philosophy, how is the ultimately virtuous man so attracted to an obvious nut job like Dominique? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess one thing I was, we were talking about this a bit in the part today was like, what is the rape scene about for Iron Rand? Like, how does she imagine that? You know, what, what is this about? And it seems to be that Dominique, um, for, for the Dominique's sort of quote virtue in this in this book is that you know she's got all these guys toadying up to her, and she's kind of um, sick of all of their toadying essentially. And so along comes Howard Rourke, and he doesn't care what like he's just going to take her by force, and that somehow makes him more of a man. I mean that seems to be the idea of the of the rape in in I guess in Rand's mind. But I wondered, you know, what is going on? You, you said that you often do dream analyses of your own novels, Steph. And w- what is that rape supposed to be about? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've thought about that over the years. And it's, it's a really, it's a tough, tough question. I don't think she ever gave. Uh, she did say about Dominique that Dominique is her in a bad mood. Uh, and you, know, you can take that with some grains of salt, I'm sure. But I think that there's some, some truth in that. I think that um, Ayn Rand was not a very good negotiator in many ways. Uh, she was, you know, quite haughty and quite arrogant and, and the sort of the stereotypical, you could say, almost Russian uh, intellectual. Uh, and, um, and I think she had a very strongly dominant aspect to her own personality and had I, I mean, she had a fairly weak-willed and pretty uh, husband, and he didn't really do a whole lot with his life other than sit around and, and enjoy her success. And uh, so I think that part of her wanted to create the kind of man that she felt would master her because she was sexually, dis- sexually dissatisfied with her husband. And I think that's fairly... That's a fairly obvious thing, given that she had this affair with, with, uh, with Brandon. And so I think that she felt this desire to be mastered because she was so masterful herself. And then I think you, you sprinkle in the melodrama. And that, uh, uh, that, that probably is some of the recipe that, uh, that goes into it. But um, I, I think that fundamentally she, she lacked a kind of gentleness and curiosity in, in her own life, and that's not the end of the world. We all have things in our personalities that we lack, but I don't think she ever held it to be much of a virtue to try to achieve that. I think she would have considered that quite weak-willed, although that was her husband, right? This is what's so complicated, is that her husband, who she loved, as she said, passionately throughout her own life, was quite the opposite of the heroes that she created in her fiction. And I can't imagine that those two are unrelated. I mean, if she admired Howard Rourke, why would she marry uh, her husband? And uh, if she married her husband, why would she need, and, and she loved that kind of gentleness and accommodation, why would she need to create a Howard Rourke? I think the relationship is complicated, but I think that there are two, two kind of opposites that she couldn't find a middle ground in. Right. That's, that's really interesting. Because, yeah, I mean, it's clearly she... I wonder if 
not clearly, but I wonder if it's something to do with like if she if she wasn't really you know a, a very good at sort of negotiating and um, finding win win situations, so to speak. Then is it the sense that for her personal relationships were perhaps more like you know someone is is going to be like the master, so to speak. Like it's basically someone's kind of wearing the trousers and it's either going to be, um, you know, uh, the, in her relationship with her husband. I mean, I don't really know anything. I've seen one movie, which is the, the Passion of Iron Man movie, but I don't really know anything more about her life outside the books. But was it the case that, um, was he like a really... Was he was he a, a a very accommodating person, or was he just a, g- a gentle guy who also you know had his own um, self esteem, so to so to so to speak? Um, no, he it. was he was overly accommodating. I mean, he agreed to the affair, though he hated oh, it. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, that, that that to me that's not a sign of high self esteem. Um, and uh, he. Uh, uh, he began, uh, at least this is what, the, there's no real proof to this stuff, but a lot of people say that, I mean, in, in the last decade or decade or two of his life, he began to drink uh, quite heavily, and he had always enjoyed painting, and he started to paint, uh, and I think that there's quite a bit of, uh, if you notice that, that Peter Keating uh, is a, starts to paint again later in his life, and Howard Rock says, like, it's too late, and I always found that to be a very heartbreaking. Oh, God, yeah, I didn't think of that. That's that's right. Of course, her husband was a painter. And yeah, and not a success. And uh, of course, he had all the time in the world because of the money she made. They lived in California, then they lived in New York. He didn't really have to work. He had all the time in the world. But I think that she was just so high maintenance that uh, he couldn't. Uh, he spent his life kind of propping her up in many ways. And uh, his painting never really went anywhere. He did get a studio, uh, and then he began, I think, to get some sort of um, illness in his, his hands, maybe arthritis or something, couldn't, couldn't paint, began to drink, would basically go to his uh, studio, not to paint, but just to drink. And then he began to suffer from dementia, and there's, to me, it's, it's a heartbreaking and tragic scene where Ayn Rand would assign him cognitive essays to help him shake off his dementia, which is such a deluded way of dealing with a physically degenerative d- disease that uh, it just shows a, a kind of being out of reality kind of thing. Uh, and um, and her, deni- like her denial of the dangers of cigarette smoking, right? I mean, she continued to smoke like a chimney, and, and you know, her do- she kept saying to her doctor, you know, give me a rational reason why I shouldn't. And the only rational reason she accepted was that she finally got lung cancer, had to have a lung removed. So there, there was, I think, a very dominant and forceful willpower that was very ferocious, and she had such a temper. I mean, when Brand, well, sorry, when Brandon finally broke off the the uh, affair, I mean, she was just savage, and and the savageness stuck. You know, I, I think we all have those moments where we get really angry, and then what happens is the cloud passes, and we're like. Oh crap! You know, <laughs> really shouldn't have done that, and we apologize. But whenever she got angry, uh, she just didn't change. Like it just got stuck in her personality, so to speak. And I think that is um, that lack of mediation, that lack of self-awareness, that lack of humility uh, is, is part of what makes her so great. I mean, she had to have that in so many ways to become. Uh, one of the preeminent writers of in the English language, as far as popularity and depth of content goes, she had to have that ferocity. Of, I think, oh, of course, the, the reports seem to be fairly strong and consistent that she was addicted to uh, amphetamines for thirty or forty years, which is uh, not. Not good for your capacity. I mean, drug addiction of any kind, substance abuse of any kind, but in particular, that kind of stuff, uh, does, I mean, it raises your, it's like being on steroids, right? It raises your level of anger. Uh, it, um, I think it raises your sexual appetite and uh, causes a whole host of other cognitive distortions, which uh, obviously gave her some fuel to finish her monstrous books, but I think that came at the cost of her personal relationships considerably. That's fascinating. I didn't know that about her. And I didn't know about the um, the lung cancer either. But that must have been, I mean, in some ways, you know, because we were talking about how, like, the smoking is so essential in all the footage you see of Rand and all of the, 
the characters in the novels are always lighting up, you know, in any key moment, they're always having a cigarette. And it's, sort and of it's a philosophical good for her, right? Like she says in, in, in Atlas Shrugged, you know, that the, the, when a man thinks the fire in his mind is like the fire in the cigarette, I mean, it doesn't, it, it, it beca- it's not just I have a bad habit. It's like it, it becomes a, a virtuous piece of art to have a cigarette. And uh, that was, uh, uh, that, that to me is, it's just too much, you know, not, you, you might just have a bad habit. <laughs> Are you going to tell your own and joke? <laughs> no, I, um, my my kind of perspective on the whole smoking thing with Iron Man is, it's, you know, it's all well and good, but like she might be this amazing orange and everything, but she might be able to run for a bus. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Gary B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually used to make jokes about Ayn Rand, worst phone sex worst phone sex operator you'll ever get. You know, <laughs> what are you wearing? <laughs> that kind of stuff. Unless you're into dominatrixes. I guess so. Yeah, dominatrixes who can barely lift a whip. You know, I need you to throw yourself at this whip. <laughs> anyway, it was the 1950s, though, wasn't it? I mean, the 1950s smoking was was seen completely differently to 10 years later even, so, I mean... Yeah, but, but if she's making a moral of argument out of it, then it's a different thing, like, just if smoking's, like, part of the landscape, but she's making a moral argument... Well, I mean, it was, though, was it was considered to be a sign of independence and, and authority, I think, in the, at, at one time, you know, smoking was really... Especially for a woman, you know? Well, look, I agree with all of that, but this is a, a philosopher who says reason and evidence should win every time, and science should win oh. every time, yeah, uh, yeah. who, you know, <laughs> into the 70s was still denying that there was any problem with, with smoking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and unfortunately, reason and evidence was that she had to have a longer read in the end. I was curious um, to ask what you guys thought about... Dominique, and, like, because, you know, Howard Rourke obviously is, like, the sort of uh, the virtue man, right? And presumably Dominique is, like, the virtue woman. Because, as Steph said, according to Ayn Rand as well, you know, you're supposed to choose the the part, you, you choose the partner that reflects your own virtue and so forth. So, like, especially... Charlotte and Hannah, I was curious, like, what, what did you make of this virtue, virtue woman? I've always kind of understood where Dominique's coming from, but I don't like her per se. Um, in fact, the only character in the book that I really like is actually Gail Wynan, not Dominique. But I understand the argument that Rand is trying to make, like, when they meet, Dominique is not quite at the uh, at Rourke's virtue level, and so I think that the the characterization was she's trying to show um, Dominique's ascent towards virtue, um, and she does it in an odd way of her basically trying to, you know, destroy herself. And I think that if I was Howard Rourke, I would not be able to wow. Wow. achieve that kind of level of detachment of seeing that the person that I supposedly loved um, try to destroy herself in quite the way that Dominique goes about doing it. So I understand the argument that Rand is trying to make, but I don't like Dominique at all, and I, I don't think that she's particularly virtuous. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually read the book years ago, so um, my, my memory is slightly, uh, slightly but um, I, I agree with you, Charlotte, and I actually read Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead back-to-back um, consecutively. Wow. Yeah, I had a run first. <laughs> um, it was pretty good. Um, but yeah, so, and I think Atlas Shrugged definitely stuck in my head more, simply because... Um, and I, I agree with you, da- um, not Dagny. Dominique is not a likable character, really. I didn't, I didn't find her particularly. Um, I didn't really feel like she was relatable. I mean, not many of Rand's characters are, but 
I felt particularly disconnected from her. And I'm, I think especially because I was directly comparing her to Dagny, who's obviously the female protagonist in um, At The Shrugged, mm. there was quite a stark contrast, I thought, between the way that Dagny was portrayed and the way that she set up Dominique. I haven't read the Alice uh, Shrugged yet, but what's the, what's the difference? Well, I think, from what I remember, Dagny just comes across as <clears throat> a lot... Um, she's kind of more of a consistent character. Mm-hmm. Um, she's, does she not have this self-destructive thing that Dominique has? Because, I mean, the whole, um, way through what's the, the whole way through this book, Dominique's sort of torturing herself. I mean, she like, gets married, deliberately marries somebody who she knows it's going to be a complete nightmare with. And uh, From what I remember, there's sort of, like, remnants of that in Dagny, but it's, it's so obvious in Dominique. And it's, it's, it's a lot more subtle in Dagny. I think there's sort of, like, she definitely has sort of moments of that. But, um, yeah, I just didn't really get Dominique as mm. a character in the same mm. way that I got what Dagny was about. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Rand sets Dominique up um, as an ice queen. If you look at the metaphors that Rand draws around her, everything is ice, everything is stone, everything is crystal, everything is these beautiful, fragile, um, you know, brittle metaphors. Um, the way she sets up Dagny, I think Dagny, because, like, she has a job and <laughs> she's good for more than, you know, slumming around a drawing room, um, she writes Dagny in a way that she kind of appears fragile and brittle to the people that, you know, are not virtuous and then to the people that are, she's much more human and much more warm in a way that Dominique never achieves even with the people that she is supposedly friends with. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I mean, the, with Dagny, Dagny overall seems, I mean, you said more human, and I think that's that's kind of the same thing. To me, she seemed just stronger, like a stronger person. Yeah. It's but like Dominique is flying to pieces at any time. Now, I know that Rand is a romantic writer, and so she's not specifically naturalistic, but imagine you had a friend like Dominique. I mean, just imagine. I mean, it's, you know, she, she comes over one day and she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this, uh, this quarry guy raped me, and I'm really attracted to him, so I think I'm going to marry the guy who hates him the most just to make him jealous, and then I think I'm going to marry another guy who hates him even more but might be secretly in love with him, and then, you know, we're going to get together and we're going to blow up this uh, housing complex. And, I mean, wouldn't you just think, like, like, God, get to a, like, you need a team of mental health professionals and people with an enormous amount of pretty sopophoric medication. I mean, she would be a borderline personality disorder, I think. It would just be, it would be someone you just want to run screaming from. Is, it, would that be an unfair thing to say? She's no, I, I think it's borderline. <laughs> I think it's sort of like full-blown personality disorder. I mean, when I was reading... She's the, the Tyler Durden of her age. Oh, yeah. I was just going to about to say, because like, when I read through the book, I was so confused for quite a while. It took me a while to clock on that there, were, there was actually just one person called Dominique, or there was one woman I was thinking of, because <laughs> right. they're completely different people. When she's around Rourke and when she's around, who was the other guy, Ed, Ed Wyatt? Yeah. Oh, was the other guy? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, I know. Wynand. 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 That's Gail Wynand. That's and the other, also the third one that she marries... Mm. Peter, Peter, Peter Keating. Keating. They're complete. She's a completely different person. It's like she doesn't even have a character. She's just like a mirror. And but, her... that's, but that's that's a borderline personality disorder, right? There's no there's no person. There's just a mirror-like manipulation of the moment, and exactly. that's not and that's not something that can be fixed by philosophy, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, she's. I mean, she's so like many faces of Ayn Rand, basically, isn't she? In some ways. Well, is she? Because if that's that's pretty scary, if she is, because uh... <laughs> Iron Man's pretty scary person. <laughs> yeah, well, I, if Iron Man was um, was um, basically high on speed and and so forth, then she probably would come across as being pretty borderline as well. Right. Do you think Iron Rand projected herself in the book more as Howard Rourke than as Dominique? Or, it seems to me that she saw herself more as Rourke, uh, more more of the male figure. 
I, yeah, I think I think that it was idealized, but I don't think she empathized with Rourke because um, I, I talked about this in a Sunday show, so I'll just touch on it briefly here. But if Howard Rourke had been born to Peter Keating's mother, would he be Howard Rourke, right? I mean, all of Ayn Rand's heroes are without family. I mean, they, they, they were never food, let alone defood, right? I mean, they, they are without family. And all of her villains, you get their family history. And their families are usually embedded in their lives. Um, Ayn Rand is savagely critical of family uh, in a way that I wouldn't, I would never go that far. Of course, people don't really see it because it's not explicit. But uh, she says that you can only be heroic in the absence of a family of origin. Uh, and, and they have to leave so damn early that you can't even remember them. I mean, all of her major heroes uh, who, who are not transitional characters going from, from neutral to, to good, they all have uh, zero brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, mothers and, and fathers. They, they have nothing like that. They're just born like Greek gods, fully, fully matured. When and you said, um... Sorry, again. Oh, sorry. Um, isn't Hank Reardon kind of the exception to that? Because you do get quite a lot in Atlas Shrugged about um, his mum and his sister. Well, yeah, but he's a transitional... I mean, I mean the, the non-transitional characters, right? Because, oh. because he, he is a real transitional character, and he would be nowhere without the ideal born adult, no family, moral gods who, who drag these transitional characters away from their families, basically. Oh, that's true, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that Howard Rourke is explicitly an orphan in this book. He's like he was and raised himself and was on his own since he was eight. Like and, and no mention of any family. And the one thing that is very clear in the Fountainhead is the destructive power of Peter Keating's mother is like drips from the page. Oh, you know, yeah. that he sits there biting his nails as his mother pounds into him all of her desires for him to be successful. And and so I thought the psychological portrait of a. A, a, a man destroyed by his mother's uh, neuroses, I thought was very, very powerful. But she missed the whole damn point because <laughs> that is the environment that Peter Keating grew up in. So right. how can he just be a villain in and of himself if she gives this amazing, and I thought very sensitive and very intelligent and very compassionate portrayal of how he became who he became and then she switches personalities and becomes this, this, this god from hell who punishes him as if he had every opportunity that Howard Rourke did. Right, right. Did she, Steph, did she have, because I know that she effectively de by leaving the Soviet Union, but did she have, um, what were her parents like towards her, do you know? Oh, yeah, they were very harsh. Um, her mother, um, uh, when she was very young, uh, Ayn Rand did something that her mother didn't like. And she, her mother took uh, uh, all of her toys, uh, including the, her favorite toy, I can't remember what it was, that she clung to and wept and you know, so ripped them out of her hands and, and put them in a big box saying that she was going to get them back in a year. And, of course, Ayn Rand marked the days. And when the year came by, the box was empty. Her mother had given the toys away uh, to, to somebody else. And, and uh, uh, there was quite a lot of uh, harshness. She had a, a distant father. Uh, who she worshipped, and I think that shows up in her male heroes uh, again and again. Oh, uh, but that's... yeah, she she did defoo, and 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 I think uh, to not to her credit at all, she wrote to her parents, giving her pen name and her the names of her books and so on, when they were living under Soviet rule, which was extreme, extremely dangerous. And she denied ever doing this, but it showed up later in in the letters. Uh, that she did this a lot. So, of course, she, her first major work uh, was We the Living, which is a, a savage condemnation of Soviet Russia, and she's writing to her parents saying, hey, I just published this book, We the Living, and it's a, a denunciation of the regime, and my pen name is Ayn Rand, and th that, to me, is, is so dissociated from the reality of her parents' lives that I can't, I can't imagine that that's anything other than suppressed rage towards parents to put them in that kind of danger. Right. Right. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think just just for the for the uh, record and my experience, you can't defoo by changing country. I don't think it's. I don't think that works. Uh, no, I agree with you. I mean, it's, separation is is not. Uh, it does not solve the problem. At least no. it's it's it sets the stage for solving the problem. But. Uh, and, and later on in life, uh, her sister, uh, who apparently she, was, she felt she was quite close to, her sister came over uh, to stay with her in New York, and they spent a very unhappy 
a week or two together before separating permanently because she felt that her sister had become um, Sovietized and irrelevant and, and all of that. So it was, uh, uh, it, it was, uh, it was tragic. Uh, I think uh, uh, the the relationship that she had with her uh, parents was not something that she, to my knowledge, was not something that she ever examined for better or for worse. And uh, I think that it was not. Uh, uh, I think that lack of examination created these two poles, right? So she, she knew enough about psychology to understand that parenting has a huge influence on who you are, which is why her villains always have this family history that explains to some degree who they are, which I think is great. Uh, and, but rather than wade into the highly ambivalent, and she, she had no luck with ambivalence, uh, like most borderline personalities. And I'm, I'm not saying she's a borderline personality. We were just working from her depiction of Dominique. I don't know. I mean, it's just, just my guess. But um, she had no, no, no luck with ambivalence. And it is a highly, highly ambivalent situation, right, when we realize that villains uh, came from monstrous themselves, who came from monstrous themselves, it's very tough to just be savagely denunciatory. Uh, at the same time, though, we, we understand that people who use moral standards to attack and abuse others, particularly children, are reprehensible. And we do have to draw a line in the sand somewhere and say, this has just become plain bad. Uh, but at the same time, we understand that they came from their own history. So there's complexity in this ambivalence, as we all know, in this stuff, which, she, she, which shows up for her evil characters, but not for her good characters, which I think is uh, uh, telling. Right. The the uh, evil characters in this book, in particular Ellsworth Toohey, right? I mean, I've seen lots of depictions of collectivists in novels and so forth, and and often collectivists are depicted as kind of kind of pathetic people who are, in a sense, like using the system because they wouldn't survive in the free market effectively, right? And this character gets to do a speech where he's like, you know, he gets to kind of twist his uh, evil moustache and explain, like, how his, his genius scheme behind, you know, collectivizing the world and so forth. And I wonder what you thought about Tui as a character. Because, I mean, obviously, he's, a, he's kind of a vehicle for Ayn Rand to sort of explain a lot of how it works and a lot of what, how, how things, in her view, have kind of, broken down in America, like the way the America, the, the, the vision that she has of this shining republic, how it's all kind of gone wrong. And Tui is like a vehicle to actually have that speech and kind of say it all. But what did you think about the, you know, his, the evil genius Tui? The, the, the Tui thing, slowly stroking a bald cat. Yeah. Um, the first thing that I see in that speech, well, besides the fact that it's, it's terrifying, but in a way, it's also um, very beautiful. It's it's like one of those sort of um, it's an encomium to to vice, basically. Um, but the first thing that I notice in the speech is exactly how wrong he is about Howard Rourke's motives. Um, Tui goes to Keating's apartment to congratulate him ostensibly, on having broken Howard Rourke. But the reasons that he lists for Keating having done so, you know, getting all of Howard Rourke's money and getting his fame on the project is precisely the stuff that Rourke has said in a previous scene to Keating that he doesn't want. So I think it very interesting that Rand is basically saying, yes, this guy's absolutely a masterpiece of evil, but only only on his own terms when he doesn't really understand um what's what so it's it, an interesting way of kind of invalidating um to his power while still showing that hey he's he's running the show in a way i think it's a very interesting sort of dualistic speech i had a thought on uh, on two week first of all yeah he was he was one of the most chilling villains that I've, I've ever read uh, and, and specifically in that speech definitely is, is a goosebump sort of making thing and, uh, and, I, and I spent a lot of time thinking about exactly how evil and how, how intelligent and how evil he, he is uh, I agree he, I think he's still missing something and, and something that, that stuck out to me is that his intelligence only goes 
down so deep and no further, which is kind of an interesting parallel to Bork's comment about uh, how much they can hurt him. So I, just that's just something I thought of while I was reading it. Yeah, and I, I think that Two is, a, I mean, a magnificently written character, and but, but in my experience, really nasty, evil people have no self knowledge whatsoever. Everything is externalized, and I think we, I mean, we wish that evil people had these kinds of uh, extravagant abilities for self knowledge, uh, and and knew that they were evil and knew. But I think that's kind of incompatible. With, I mean, the immoral people that I know have no self knowledge whatsoever, and, and that's the really the root of their uh, of how they can stay on that evil path. And so I was, while I think that the speech the speeches that he gives are magnificent, you know, how many trolls know what they're doing? Um, and he is one of the ultimate literary trolls, right? Uh, they don't. They, they externalize completely, and I was sort of dissatisfied at that because what it says is that you can have all of this self-knowledge and still be evil. And, of course, the purpose, at least to philosophy as I understand it, is that if you have self-knowledge, you can't be evil. That's, that's sort of the point of self-knowledge. Right, right. And it is, and it is in that sense, he is, you know, the kind of... Um, uh, he's a bit of a kind of... A conspiracy theorist's wet dream, isn't he? Because he is the guy pulling the levers, you know, the kind of single <laughs> right. evil genius behind the behind the curtains pulling the levers. When yeah, who's fully conscious of of what what he's doing? Right, right, right. It sort of reminds me uh, if you if you ever see documentaries or or read about the last days of Hitler, that uh, all of his entourage just before the end were waiting for this big speech where he was going to finally reveal, because he had nothing left to lose, why he was going to finally reveal why he did what he did and what he was all about. And uh, his secretary in particular was just dying, was waiting for this, waiting for this big speech from Hitler just before the end. But all he did was he repeated, and she said so in interviews after the war, with extreme bitterness, disappointment, and, and anger. He just repeated the same crazy, anti-Semitic, uh, raging nonsense that he had spouted since she'd first known him in the 20s, and then he popped a pill and died. And, and th there's this idea that, that there is within evil this grand plan, this sinister amount of self-knowledge, which you can see in some of the fantasies, as you say, conspiracy theorists, that there's all these people in a, in a room somewhere doing all this smoky deals and so on. And... I was even at the time disappointed when I first read it that Ayn Rand would give this amount of self-knowledge to somebody who still remained evil, because then it shut off, it, to me, it, it shut off that path to virtue. So you can have an extreme amount of self-knowledge and still be fully and totally committed to destroying virtue and, and you know, molesting cats and so on. And so Ayn Rand, to me, is explicitly state, stating that self-knowledge does not cure you of evil, which was very much against the Socratic tradition. And I think that... Um, I think that was more her resistance to self-knowledge than anything objective that had been figured out. Oh, that's a very interesting idea. So, in other words, if she had accepted the concepts, or sorry, if she accepted the framework that with self-knowledge comes, you know, it, 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 you can't, can't really avoid virtue because you're, you're impelled towards it because we are all virtue machines in the end, right? That if she accepted that, she'd have to do a lot more self-knowledge um, which maybe she wasn't really up for finding out the answers to. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. Of course, uh, the the purpose of self knowledge is to withdraw projections because we can only act against people when we project our dark side onto them and then we attack them, right? And and you can see that, of course, that's very en endemic to Ayn Rand's whole life was the projection of any of her ir irrationalities or her hostilities or her destructiveness, a complete projection of it onto the other with a savage and endless attack upon the other. And that is a great temptation for people who are interested in virtue. And, and we think, I certainly know, I go through it. I have to deal with that within, within myself. But uh, if she had said that, like if she had gone down the path of self-knowledge, then she would have depicted, and I think that, that Dostoevsky depicts this very well, that uh, it is a lack of self-knowledge that, uh, that goes to, uh, uh, that, that creates and maintains, maintains evil. Uh, and I think Nietzsche does that very well as well. But she wasn't uh, able to go down that path because I think self-knowledge for her would have required a humility that was not within the scope of her personality as it stood.
I mean, self-knowledge arises, like science arises from, I don't have a clue how the universe works. And self-knowledge arises from, I don't know how I work. Right? It's a fundamental statement of humility. And that, I don't think, was, was much on Miss Rand's list of to-dos.